and welcome to PubK's 2022 Government Contracts Annual Review. We're thrilled to have more than 3,000 session registrants for the program over the next four days. Over the next four afternoons, we will present 12 different sessions with over 45 presenters and almost 20 hours of content. We hope you'll be able to join us for most, if not all of these sessions, but a separate registration is required for each session that you want to attend. My name is Alan Schwatkin. I'm the president of the PubK Group and a partner in the law firm Nichols Lou. I'll be your host, facilitator, and moderator for this year's annual review. May we be able to convene in person next year. The PubK Group consists of three newsletters, PubK Law, PubK Compliance, and PubK Cyber. Many of you are already subscribers to one or more of these publications, and we very much appreciate your support. Some of you joining this annual review are not yet subscribers. I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber. Information is at the website shown on the slide or is available from any of the contacts you have at the PubK Group. This conference would not have been possible without the strong support of our event sponsors, all of whom are listed on these next two slides. I encourage you to look at the skills and the capabilities these firms have. In lieu of speaker gifts and in honor of our sponsors, PubK is making a contribution to the Capital Area Food Bank. With the food crisis facing our communities, including the military, and here in the Washington DC metropolitan area, I hope you will also consider making an individual or an organizational contribution. Since the entire program is being held virtually, all attendance will be in listen-only mode. Your video will remain disabled throughout the session. But we do welcome your questions. Use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. However, with so many attendees, it will probably not be possible to answer all of the questions in real time. We are capturing your questions and will endeavor to answer as many questions as possible over the next couple of days. All presentation slides, along with the audio, will be available for download from the PubK Group website, probably within a week or so of the conclusion of the full annual review. We'll send an email when this registration and this information is available for download, how to access it, and for how long the material will be available. We are also applying for CLE in several states. While we cannot guarantee approval, we expect that acceptance within the next few weeks. Again, we'll notify all attendees when those approvals have been received. Finally, if you're interested in obtaining CLA, please look for our poll questions during the presentation. The state boards require us to verify your participation during the event. The poll question is a simple yes, no. We will keep track of the responses to verify that you viewed the panel. If you do not wish to obtain CLE credit, you can disregard the poll or just answer for fun. Now, I'm thrilled to kick off the seventh PubK annual review with our session one panel on bid protest. Our distinguished panel members are Craig Holman from Arnold and Porter, Kevin Mullen from Morrison Forrester, Rich Rector, DLA Piper, Cherie Owen from Curl and Mooring, and Jay Carey from Covington and Burling. Jay, over to you. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here uh, with you and with my fellow panelists to kick off this year's uh, PubK annual review. Um, as you'll see, as we move through our panel, we focus quite a lot on the Court of Federal Claims and the Federal Circuit this year, which is somewhat unusual. And I'll start things off with a discussion of developments with respect to blue and gold. So as you all know, of course, that the court does not have the same timeliness rules as GAO. And until 2007, the only pretty much hard and fast rule was the six year statute of limitations, subject of course, to the doctrine of latches and the possibility that delay might limit the availability of injunctive relief. Then along comes blue and gold in 2007, which articulated what is now a bedrock timeliness requirement. Uh, and, and I'll just read the sort of the key quote from that decision to set the scene here. Uh, a party who has the opportunity to object, and I'll come back to that word object in, in a moment, 
Uh, a party who has the opportunity to object to the terms of a government solicitation containing a patent error and fails to do so prior to the close of, bidding, of the bidding process waives its ability to raise the same objection subsequently in a bid protest action in the Court of Federal Claims. Now, the basis for Blue and Gold's uh, waiver rule is in the Court of Federal Claims jurisdictional statute, 28 USC 1491, which requires the court to give due regard to, among other things, the need for expeditious resolution of the action. And from a policy perspective, the Federal Circuit said that a waiver rule prevents contractors from taking advantage of the government and other bidders and avoids costly after the fact litigation. So we know that blue and gold applies to patent errors in a solicitation, but in the wake of that decision, some important open questions remained. In particular, what does it mean to object? What is necessary and sufficient to preserve a protest of the solicitation's terms? The Federal Circuit shed a little bit more light on that question when it um, decided a case called Bantam in 2015. Uh, in that case, the protester raised its objection with the agency informally, but did not file a formal protest. And the Federal Circuit explained that mere notice of dissatisfaction or objection is insufficient to preserve a defective solicitation challenge. The court further explained that a formal agency level protest before award would likely preserve a protester's post award challenge of a solicitation. The circuit talked about the importance of, uh, of requiring uh, that, and this is the, the circuit's language, that the prescribed formal routes for protest be followed to avoid waiver. And it emphasized that by doing that, by filing a formal protest, that would trigger a stay and would ensure a timely resolution of the issue. So in the wake of Bantam, we knew that an agency level protest would likely preserve the issue, but what if the agency then denied that, pro that agency level protest? Would the protester need to continue pursuing the, the objection through what the federal circuit called the prescribed formal routes for protest? Or having put the agency on notice, can a protester wait until after award? And that brings us to Harmonia. So the facts in Harmonia are pretty straightforward. In November of 2018, Harmonia timely files an agency level protest of the solicitation's terms before, um, uh, before the deadline for proposal submission. In December, just a few weeks later, the agency denies the protest and Harmonia does nothing further before the award, does not file a pre-award GAO protest, does not file a pre-award protest at the court. Um, then at the end of April, 2019, the agency makes award. And in May, about five months after denial of its agency protest, Harmonia files a post-award protest at the Court of Federal Claims, re-raising its challenge to the terms of the solicitation. Now, at the Court of Federal Claims, the court applied, the bl applied blue and gold and found a waiver. The court held that Harmonia had ample time to pursue its claims in a pre-award protest at GAO or at the court. So in other words, the court, uh, the court of Federal Claims thought that Harmonia needed to continue, to continue to pursue the prescribed formal routes for protest to preserve its concern. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, that, that wasn't a terribly surprising outcome. If we can go to the next slide, please. But um, at, on appeal, um, the Federal Circuit overturned. And the Federal Circuit uh, cited Bantam's statement that a timely pre-award agency protest would likely preserve a post-award protest. The circuit explained that blue and gold is predicated not only on avoiding delay by the protester, but also on the notion of preserving challenges and providing notice to interested parties. And the court concluded, and you see the key language here on the slide, Harmonia's undisputedly timely formal challenge of the solicitation 
removes this case from the ambit of blue and gold. So let me pause here and note that we now have a clear diverge, divergence from GAO. Um, as I'm sure everybody knows at GAO, you must file a GAO protest within 10 days of agency adverse action on your agency level protest. So with GAO, GAO you can't simply wait until after award. Uh, but in the wake of the Harmonia decision, you may well be able to wait until after award to go to the court. But, and, and it's a significant but, do not assume like the Rolling Stones that time is on your side. Uh, and that's because the circuit included some important words of warning. Um, the circuit said, and this is a quote, our opinion should not be read as condoning delay. And it went on to explain that under certain circumstances, delaying bidders may face adverse consequences, but we are not persuaded in this case that imposition of a blue and gold waiver should be one of those consequences. Uh, the circuit also commented that the Court of Federal Claims has relatively broad authority to fashion a remedy. And as we all know, in deciding whether to issue injunctive relief, one of the factors the court must consider, for example, is a balancing of the harms. And it is certainly conceivable uh, that waiting until after award to re-raise a solicitation challenge could shift the balance of harms and potentially lead to a denial of injunctive relief. So this is a good decision for protesters, no doubt about it, but it's important not to read too much into it and not to be complacent about moving quickly uh, when you have a concern. So that's Harmonia, and I'll turn now to developments flowing uh, from the circuit's decision, federal circuit's decision in Inserso. Now, uh, as many of you may remember, we covered the federal circuit's decision last year, but it sets the scene for two other notable decisions coming out of the Court of Federal Claims this year. So I'll just take a moment here to remind everybody of the key points in the decision. Uh, the solicitation in, in CERSO provided for a two-track competition, uh, one full and open track and the other for small businesses. The solicitation also allowed small businesses to compete on both tracks, both sides of the competition. And as things turned out, uh, the agency made award on the full and open side about nine months before making award on the small business side. And then the agency in the normal course conducted its debriefings on the full and open side. And it provided as part of those debriefings information about price and information about the evaluation. Subsequently, after award on the small business side, Inserso claimed that small businesses that have participated in the full and open competition gained an unfair competitive advantage from their debriefings in connection with the full and open uh, competition and were there, you know, thereafter able to use that information in competing on the small business side. The federal circuit applied blue and gold and it held that Inserso should have protested between the time that the full and open awards were made and the deadline for its final proposal in the small business track several months later. Now, Inserso was certainly an odd set of facts and it, it was not your uh, run of the mill solicitation defect. And that gen generated a fair amount of discussion uh, about whether it expanded uh, blue and gold uh, uh, beyond mere solicitation defects. But it's worth noting the language that the circuit used in its decision. The circuit said that Inserso waived under blue and gold because a bidder, and this is the key quote, exercising reasonable and customary care would have been on notice of the alleged defect in the solicitation long before the awards were made. So the circuit viewed the problem as a solicitation defect and the problem became patent when the agency made award in one track before the other. Nonetheless, in two cases before the Court of Federal Claims this year, the government and interveners cited in CERSO as a basis to expand blue and gold beyond solicitation defects. And that brings us to our last two cases on blue and gold. All right, first up is VS2. 
Just to quickly cover the facts of that case, VS2 was the original awardee. Uh, Vectris protested that award at GAO and GAO sustained the protest. The agency then took corrective action and awarded the contract to Vectris. So the award flipped as a result of the corrective action from VS2 to Vectris. VS2 then filed a post-award protest at the Court of Federal Claims challenging the agency's corrective action. And relying on Inserso, the government and Vectris argued that blue and gold should apply to corrective action challenges and more broadly, that it should apply to any alleged problem in the procurement process. So according to the government and the intervener, VS2 had to challenge the corrective action before award. In response, VS2, the protester, argued that blue and gold is limited to solicitation defects. The court uh, presented with that question, then engaged in a quite detailed and careful reading of Inserso and the other key decisions in the blue and gold line of cases. The court noted that blue and, the blue and gold waiver doctrine is narrow, uh, and it concluded that, and this is the key language you see on the slide, uh, there is no suggestion whatsoever in blue and gold that its waiver rule applies to anything other than an action challenging the terms of a solicitation. The court further explained that in Cerso shifted the cutoff for a challenge to a solicitation that would not have been possible prior to the proposal due date. So recall there, the defect in the two track solicitation was not necessarily clear from the beginning when proposals were originally submitted, but it became clear when the award was made in one track before the other. And once it became clear, that triggered the need to protest. And the court uh, ultimately concluded that because VS2's protest did not challenge a solicitation defect, uh, that blue and gold did not apply. That brings us to our last case, uh, which is Amazon. Uh, and um, there, uh, the protester alleged bias on the part of former President Trump. And the government and the awardee argued that Amazon was aware of evidence of the alleged bias before award and therefore had, had to protest that issue before award. As in VS2, the government and the awardee argue that Inserso expanded blue and gold beyond solicitation terms. Um, also, as in VS2, the court and Amazon rejected that argument. It explained that in Inserso, it was, and this is a quote from the decision, patent that the solicitation allowed and that there was likely to occur the unequal disclosure regarding prices. So again, a solicitation defect. And the court also concluded that prior decisions in the blue and gold line of cases do not support a claim based on, and this is the key language on your slide, allegations not directly related to the terms or structure of the solicitation itself. So the bottom line is that both decisions declined to read in Cerso as expanding blue and gold beyond solicitation defects. Uh, I'm sure there will be more to come in the world of blue and gold uh, as we move forward into the next year. Uh, but that's the update for now. And with that, I'll turn it over to Craig. Thanks, Jay. Uh, and thanks, Pub K and, and Alan for putting on this, uh, this great um, annual event every year. It's a great way to end the last year and really start uh, a new year in the world of public contracts, that's for certain. Uh, the, from my perspective, uh, 2021 was a really exciting year in government contracts. I think Jay's kicked us off well in showing the developments that have occurred in this space. Uh, what, you know, what is really unique about it, I think, as far as the year goes, is that we've had important decisions, not just out of, uh, GAO, but also out of the federal circuit and the court of federal claims. It's really been a, a fantastic year. And we've seen in some instances, as Jay just mentioned, that there is divergence that's developed in the law. And we've also seen in other areas, as I'll talk about here with respect to standing, that we've seen convergence in the law among the various fora. And so that's a good place for me to start today. I'm going to be uh, next slide, please. I'm going to be talking today about standing, or if you prefer, in 
bid protest parlance, interested party status. And really it is, as you're gonna see, I hope from these slides that it's an excellent example of the, uh, both the diversity and number of important decisions that we had in 2021 government contracts law. The four really brought their, their A games to the area last year, that's for certain. So before we get too far down into standing as related to bid protests, I wanna take a step back and talk about what is standing. Uh, this may be a primer for some and, and new information for others, but standing from a litigation stand, uh, standpoint is all about who can sue. In a traditional district court concept, it is a constitutional concept that bounds the court's jurisdiction. So as we talk about it here today, I'm gonna, I am gonna start out by talking about it in the context of a district court and a traditional district court matter. And then I'll drill down into the bid protest arenas. In a traditional Article III bid protest district, uh, sorry, in a traditional Article III court matter, standing focuses on three things. It focuses on injury in fact, causal connection between the injury and the conduct challenged, in a material likelihood that a favorable decision by the court could redress the matter before it. This is the teaching uh, that many of us heard in Khan Law in Lujan, and the Supreme Court has echoed in repeatedly in the uh, decades since. So some of you are saying, hey, Craig, thank you for the constitutional law primer, but what does this have to do with bid protest for the Government Accountability Office, a legislative branch entity, in the U.S. Court of Federal Claims in Article I Court. I'm going to talk about that now. So that is indeed a good question. And the answer in both fora is that standing principles have been baked by Congress directly into the bid protest jurisdictional statutes. So where are these statutorily baked in standing rules I referenced? In the, court, in the case of GAO, as you can see on my first uh, slide, they are in the Competition and Contracting Act, 31 USC 3551, and specifically in its definition of an interested party, essentially telling us that an interested party is an actual or prospective offer whose direct uh, economic interest would be affected by the award of a contract or the failure to award of a, con a contract. This, in GAO parlance, interested party law, is really standing. The Court of Federal Claims, for its part, takes its standing rules. First of all, I should say with the Court of Federal Claims, it does subscribe to the Article III st uh, standards of standing. It then layers on top of them what tw uh, 28 U.S.C. 1491 B.1 uh, has told it. So Congress by 28 uh, U.S.C. 1491 B.1 has limited the court's jurisdiction uh, by saying that the court has jurisdiction to render judgment on an action by an interested party. Okay, so here we see that word interested party again. What's interesting when we talk about the Court of Federal Claims jurisdiction under 28 USC 1491B is that Congress, when uh, it put 1491B in by the Administrative Dispute Resolution Act amending the Tucker Act, did not define interested party. So uh, it didn't take long, of course, for that issue to get up in front of the federal circuit. What does interested party mean in the context of 28 U.S.C. 1491b? And uh, the federal circuit, and this will, we can come back around and talk about this a bit when we talk about aerospray a little bit later on, the federal circuit, a number of years back, 2000, 2001, an American Federation of Government Employees said, that it was going to look to the SICA definition. So essentially the definition that GAO applies of interested party in its application of standing. So at GAO, what we look at is interested party uh, is essentially defined by SICA in 31 USC 3551. And in the Court of Federal Claims, it does subscribe to stand traditional standing law, but essentially what it says is that the ADRA and the Tucker Act narrow traditional standing rules. So we're not going to apply a traditional Administrative Procedure Act standing test, for instance, we're actually going to apply the Tucker Act's test of interested party. What does that mean at the court? So 
one of the interesting cases we had last year is a federal circuit dis, uh, decision, Asset Protection and Services LP, you see cited there on the slide, which tells us that there are two things a protester must establish to prove standing in a protest. You've got to show you're an actual or prospective bidder with uh, a direct economic interest, and you've got to show harm or prejudice. Both of these, importantly, for bid protesters, it's important to remember, are jurisdictional prerequisites, showing these things are jurisdictional prerequisites in the court to the court taking the matter. Standing is a jurisdictional threshold, and you've got to meet this two-pronged test in court, uh, which, as I mentioned, is largely derived from GAO's definition of interested party. Next slide, please. So how did these rules play out? in 2021 in the two fora, uh, uh, the Court of Federal Claims and GAO, and obviously the Federal Circuit on top of the Court of Federal Claims. Let's start by looking at pre-award standing. So what happens in a pre-award bid protest when we look at standing? Again, it's the same uh, two-part test, the same interested party test that we have to apply here. One of the interesting cases that we had out of GAO uh, in 2021 was Accenture Federal Services, you see cited in the top bullet there on the screen. Uh, essentially, in that case, GAO made clear that a prospective bidder or offer, as we just mentioned with this two-prong test, whether you're applying GAO's statutory rule or the two-prong test uh, that the Federal Circuit has laid out, is that you've got to be a bidder or offer and you've got to have an economic interest in the procurement and you've got to have an economic interest, essentially, that the fora can satisfy by its protest. Accenture was interesting case because essentially in Accenture, in this pre-award protest, Accenture went before GAO and challenged the corporate experience requirements in CMS procurement. And essentially what Accenture said was those corporate experience requirements were not high enough uh, that they, the way the solicitation had structured the corporate experience requirements, uh, the bar could be cleared by more offerers than Accenture thought was, uh, was appropriate. And Accenture was the incumbent, so it's, it's no surprise that Accenture had corporate experience that was at a very good match for what the agency needed. And what it was saying was, look, the way they've described corporate experience really uh, doesn't fit the procurement. Uh, what the general, uh, sorry, the Government Accountability Office had to say in that procurement was that Accenture was not an interested party to make that argument because Accenture actually passed the corporate experience requirement, exceeded the corporate experience requirement. GAO was not going to find an economic interest to essentially raise the bar for others. And this is an important uh, pre-award standing rule for, for GAO uh, and for all involved in, in the procurement field through to understand. GAO as a general rule is not interested in raising bars, it's interested in taking bars down. So if you believe that a, a procurement needs tighter restrictions, you really better have a statutory basis for demanding that from GAO because as a general principle, they're not there to raise bars uh, to restrict competition. They're there to tear bars down and, and allow for more fulsome competition. So uh, let's take a quick look at uh, pre-award standing in the Court of Federal Claims land shark shredding, uh, sorry, this is actually a fe federal circuit decision following a court of federal claims decision. And uh, this decision actually broke against overall, uh, broke against land shark shredding at the federal circuit. The federal circuit dismissed, uh, sorry, affirmed the uh, court of federal claims dismissal of the matter, but it didn't do so on grounds of standing. In a sense, but it did actually discuss uh, a bit uh, standing in pre-award context and essentially uh, reaffirm the, the court's two-part test. What was interesting about this, uh, in this case, in this land shark case from the Federal Circuit, is that the Federal Circuit essentially said that uh, the agency in this case came before the Federal Circuit and said land shark, and there were two bidders in this procurement, both land shark and the other veteran-owned small business had overbid the uh, funding that the agency had allocated the estimates, the independent government uh, estimate, and also the funding that the agency had allocated for this particular procurement. And uh, 
the argument from the United States was that this stripped uh, land shark of standing because essentially the government didn't have sufficient funding to give the award to uh, land shark shredding. The Federal Circuit disagreed uh, in this particular case. And what they said was that, that it wasn't clear from the information before the court that that was a prohibition or a bar that that uh, to the agency making award and therefore it was not going to find that land shark lacked standing. But uh, you know that said, it is uh, the court went on to dismiss the land shark shredding case for other reasons. But it is an, an important uh, bound on uh, pre award standing. So let's uh, go to the next slide, please. Let's turn for a second to post award standing. This is an area where I think we've seen. I mentioned that convergence uh, following Jay's discussion of some divergence between where the Federal Circuit and uh, Court of Federal Claims on the one hand and GAO uh, is on the other hand with respect to timing. This is an area where I think we saw a lot of convergence uh, between the two fora actually last year. And uh, I'm gonna start with the HVF West decision. The uh, HVF West decision, which is the second bullet there. And I wanna start that's there because this is an interesting case. What this was a DLA sales procurement. It did actually, however, involve some demilitarization services, which is how it ended up in the Court of Federal Claims. And the protester submitted the fourth ranked price, made only general challenges to the intervening offers. The Federal Circuit and HVF found that there was uh, no substantial chance of awards. So remember, we have to have uh, two elements in standing when we're before the, the courts, you've got to have uh, that you're an actual uh, bidder or offer and that you've got harm. And so applying the substantial chance test, the federal circuit said that HVF, which had submitted the fourth rank price and made only general challenges to the intervening offers had no substantial chance of award and therefore lacked standing. Uh, the reason I flip these up is because I wanted to emphasize the point these two bullets up, so I wanted to emphasize a point I made before about convergence. Gulf civilization uh, is actually a GAO decision, and it uh, involved also a, a DLA procurement in a FAR Part 13.5 procurement. And what was really jumped out at me was that it was very notable for its heavy citation to HVF West. And uh, essentially, GAO found that the protester, which faced a record of 12 lower priced offers, lacked standing given the procurement structure at hand in that procurement, and that the fact that the protester had not challenged the intervening offers again. So, or at least not uh, done it with sufficient uh, particularity. And GAO dismissed this matter. And it's easy enough if folks have had a chance to go back and look at this, to look at Gulf civilization and say that Gulf civilization, that's great, uh, Craig, but Gulf civilization really reads like it's a unique set of facts uh, and that it's limited to its facts. But what was very interesting, and that uh, Gulf civilization, if I recall correctly, was uh, issued by uh, Mr. Uh, Wesser and Mr. Goldstein out of GAO. What's interesting is that we've just had our first big standing case of 2022, uh, Manhattan Strategy Group, LLC reconsideration. It's not in the materials, but for folks uh, who are looking for it, came out January 11th, 2022, also written by Mr. Wester and Mr. Goldstein, if I, if I noted that correctly. Really our first big standing case of 2022, and it actually is a much more traditional procurement and applies the same HVF uh, West and Federal Circuit lines to make clear that whether you're at GAO or the Court of Federal Claims now, if you're not, and, and frankly, Manhattan strategy only involved three offers, and uh, the, it, this is really the third place offer Manhattan strategy challenging the award, and GAO said where it's clear because the agency traded off against the other two offers, not Manhattan strategy. Uh, there was sufficient evidence in the record that Manhattan strategy lacked standing to bring uh, a number of its protest grounds. 
So in any event, these are what's important to me about this is that we are definitely are in the post-award context seeing convergence and we're seeing increased application from my perspective of um, dismissals for standing where there are potential intervening offers. And I should take a moment to, uh, to mention whether you're talking about district court, you're talking about uh, court of federal claims bid protests, or you're talking about GAO, that standing is an argument by argument based issue. Many times it can take out an entire protest, but it also can take out arguments. And that's just important for practitioners to remember as they look at these issues. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so 2021 was not just interesting because we saw uh, a number of cases reaffirming traditional standing principles in government contracts. Uh, and expounding upon traditional principles. 2021 was also very interesting with respect to standing because we saw uh, new and increasingly important issues addressed. So one of the things that happened in 2021 was we have had uh, multiple award, uh, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, contract split develop at the US uh, Court of Federal Claims, among the US Court of Federal Claims, and also now, uh, we had already a split between GAO and the Court of Federal Claims, but now we have at least one uh, judge at the Court of Federal Claims who's in line with GAO on its view of uh, how MADIX are treated as a matter of standing analysis. And let me start before I, before I go into this with why it matters, because some people might think, well, you know, Craig, wow, are we down in, are we really down into the weeds here? Do I have to understand standing? in MADIC contracts? And the answer really is yes, because what we've seen across the last few decades, and I think is echoed by this uh, GAO report for folks who want to pull it up, is the increasing use of IDIQ contracts by the US government. It has become the vehicle of contracting choice, you might say, in procurement. In uh, uh, <clears throat> this latest GAO report, there are statements that over $200 billion a year are being let across IDIQ contracts at this point in time. So it is a massive, widely used contract vehicle. And we also know, although it may not be this way in practice uh, at all times, but we also know that the preference of Congress with respect to IDIQ contracts is that agencies will default to multiple award IDIQ contracts, so not single award IDIQ contracts. Uh, which this issue would obviously be less relevant to. But, uh, you know, the fact also remains that the, there are still an awful lot of single award IDIQ contracts being made, but multiple award IDIQ contracts are a major contracting vehicle uh, inside of federal contracts. So this matter, this issue really does matter. In the question that the, the made standing disagreement that it's arisen is, if you are an awardee, if you're a multiple award IDIQ awardee, do you have standing to protest another awardee's receipt of a MADIC contract? And as we look back uh, prior to 2021, really what we saw was a split between the GAO and the Court of Federal Claims on this point. You can see that in the two 2016 decisions that are cited on my slide, Aegis Defense Services, in which GAO said, I'll say pretty much categorically, that an awardee does not meet the definition of a disappointed, uh, sorry, an interested party because it's not a disappointed bidder. Once you take on the mantle of an awardee, your status changes in a procurement and you cannot qualify as an interested party. It's pretty close to a bright line rule in Aegis, though I, you know, uh, GAO, as most four are, was careful not uh, to be too uh, bright line about that. But certainly Aegis set up at GAO that as a MADIC awardee, it's very difficult to protest an award to another MADIC awardee. Uh, <clears throat> the Court of Federal Claims, Judge Letow in 2016, disagreed and actually looked at a MADIC and said, that national was indeed uh, still an actual bidder because it did bid on the solicitation, that there wasn't this transformation to uh, uh, con uh, an awardee. 
And essentially, that's, you know, that's national at a high level. What happened in 2021 uh, was that Judge Solomson at the Court of Federal Claims in a very lengthy and uh, uh, reasoned decision that will take you on a tour through standing law from Article Three. Uh, all through the bid protest jurisdictions and some of the history I've talked about. In a lengthy decision, Judge uh, Solomson essentially uh, drew a respectful di different conclusion from uh, the national decision and essentially said that the court, from his perspective, uh, in Aerospray was going to sign on to the definitional uh, issue I just mentioned from Aegis that being a contract awardee was a basis essentially to transform you out of bitter, disappointed, bitter status. I wanna say that Judge Thompson was very careful to not to paint with a broad brush here. And there are clearly situations, factual situations where uh, under aerospray, you could have a circumstance even inside of Judge Thompson's uh, recitation of the law, you can have circumstances where um, one Medic awardee can protest another Medic awardee. For Judge Solms, and at least, you know, reading into the decision, it seemed to me that he, uh, what a key distinguishing factor was, was every, is every awardee getting the identical contract? So if there were different regions of a country awarded, uh, one, offer got, one offer got more of the work than another, those type of things, the analysis would change. I think under aerospray, but certainly under aerospray, if you're just getting essentially a hunting license as part of your MADIC contract award, then at least uh, uh, from Judge Solomson's perspective that the Court of Federal Claims uh, in Federal Circuit case law does not provide you with standing. So in other words, you are not uh, capable of bringing that type of action uh, under aerospray. But again, this is a divergence of opinion at the Court of Federal Claims at this point in time. Moving on to the next slide. One more issue I wanna make sure that I touch here. Uh, another interesting topic in standing during uh, 2021, important for the practitioners and the audience in particular to remember is another land sharks uh, shredding case. By the way, if, if folks noticed a lot of land sharks uh, shredding cases, you can see in the footnotes of this particular Court of Federal Claims decision authored by Judge Firestone, if I uh, recall correctly, that land shark filed a spate of protests uh, uh, related to the rule of two application. And uh, this is one of them. I've mentioned another one that was up at the Federal Circuit uh, last year as well. But this one is interesting from a standing perspective because it teaches us again, as many of us already knew, that corporate transactions can create problems for proposals and problems for contracts. So in this case, we land shark shredding had a matter that was before the Court of Federal Claims. And indeed they were the parties were arguing the cross motions for judgment on the administrative record when it became apparent to the court that land shark shredding had engaged in an asset sale of its government contracts line of business to another company. And it prompted the court to ask the parties to brief the issue of whether that stripped land shark shredding of standing to bring its protest. Ultimately, the court determined that this sale, which happened uh, post-proposal submission, uh, <clears throat> had effectively stripped the uh, land shark shredding of a stand, a standing. What was interesting about it is it appears to have occurred after the protest was filed. So if you read the footnotes of this case and you're a constitutional law scholar, you may say, hey, hey uh, Craig, is this really a case about standing or is this a case about mootness? Uh, and it's an interesting question that Judge Firestone takes up in one of the footnotes in her case, noting, of course, that standing is determined traditionally at the time an action is filed. And if a standing uh, matter arises during a, the course of litigation, it's traditionally treated under the mootness doctrine. The court treated it because of the statutory definition of interested party that we talked about here. 
uh, primarily as a standing doctrine, but Judge Firestone also noted in her footnote that the case was moot as well. So to the extent that you're you're interested in the difference between standing and mootness in the bid protest arena, that's one place you can look. So the practitioner's tip really from this one is to, when you're engaged in corporate transactions, to understand that uh, they have the possibility of impacting not just your proposals, not just your contracts, but also your protests if you have them pending. And so uh, with that said, I think I've covered the landscape today of 2021 standing decisions. As I've already mentioned, 2022 has started off with a bang on this topic with Manhattan strategies already. Uh, in any event, look forward to your questions and over to you, Rich. All right. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate that. And I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon with this uh, distinguished panel and on issues as, as uh, Craig and Jay said that are of such great interest to the procurement community. Uh, my topic today is the procurement record, the set of documents that reflects the actions and the decision making of an agency in a challenged procurement and on which the GAO or the court, uh, depending on which form uh, you bring a protest in, would decide the merits of the case. So why is this important? The procurement record, um, it's a big issue. Uh, it gets litigated frequently. Uh, in most protests, there are disputes about whether documents um, are complete or whether there are additional documents that should be provided as part of the record. And the reason it's critical is that, except in rare circumstances, um, it's the sole basis for the Court of Federal Claims or the GAO's decision. Both forums reach their decisions based on record reviews. They review the documents, except in rare cases. There's generally not discovery. There's generally not an evidentiary hearing uh, regarding the procurement. So bid protests are by definition record reviews. And so what is in the record is obviously a critical issue. Also, neither forum reviews procurements de novo. Um, neither forum decides what it thinks is best or correct in terms of the procurement process without deference to the agency's decision. Rather, both fora um, review an agency's actions with deference to the agency in most cases to determine if the agency's actions were reasonable and in accordance with law. And so I think it's fair to think of the record as both the foundation of a bid protest and also the building material from which the GAO or the court constructs a decision. I think it's not surprising then that the composition of the record, what is in the record and what is not in the record uh, can determine the outcome of a bid protest and can be the subject of legitimate dispute between the parties to a protest. So, in, let, let's start with the basics and the first slide here uh, gets at um, the basics of what is required in a record at both the GAO and the Court of Federal Claims. And the practical answer is, and this is really important for everyone that's involved in bid protest to understand, and it's sometimes frustrating to, um, to private practitioners, but the practical answer is that it depends on which forum you're in. And as this slide reflects, the statutory basis for the procurement record at the GAO and the record at the Court of Federal Claims differ. At the GAO, by statute, a protest has to be decided based on, quote, a complete report, including all relevant documents, end quote. So the GAO's rules and its regulations provide that an agency has to produce an agency report that includes, quote, all relevant documents or portions of documents. And GAO's rules also say that the agency report has to include all relevant documents or portions thereof um, that are not previously furnished. And it gives examples of um, what those documents are. And at the end of that list of examples is any other relevant documents. So clearly at GAO, 
by statute, by regulation, relevance is a central issue. Um, at the Court of Federal Claims, however, a different standard applies. And under the Administrative Procedures Act, which applies at the court, as we all know, the a protest is decided based on a review of, quote, the whole record. So it begs the question, what, what does a whole record mean? <laughs> what does that phrase mean? And how is it different than a record that includes all relevant documents? Is it different? Should it be different? Uh, and how do those two standards work in practice? So these important questions were addressed this past year in protests brought by Oak Grove Technologies. First in a protest at the GAO, which was denied, and then in a protest at the Court of Federal Claims in which the protester prevailed. Next slide, please. At the GAO, the protester alleged that the awardee had an organizational conflict of interest and the protester also challenged the Army's evaluation of both its own and the awardee's proposal. GAO denied the protest in a decision from December of 2020, and it found that the agency had reasonably evaluated Oak Grove's proposal as technically unacceptable under a program management subfactor. And so consistent with GAO precedent, GAO did not reach the other issues, the OCI issue or um, the alleged misevaluation of the awardee's proposal because the protester was ineligible for award. So it was not an interested party, as we just heard Craig, uh, Craig explain, because it was ineligible for award, it was an, not an interested party to challenge those other issues. So the issues of the OCI and um, the evaluation of the awardee's proposal, among other challenges, do not get addressed by the court, uh, by, I'm sorry, by the GAO. Uh, Oak Grove then files an action in the Court of Federal Claims where the case is assigned to Judge Solomson. Um, and Judge Solomson reaches a very different conclusion. And in August, 2021, enjoined the Army from um, further performance of the contract at issue, except for some task orders that had already been issued. Now, as shown on this slide, the court reached four conclusions. First, and we're gonna cover this in a little more detail, the court found that the government had violated the court's rules on filing an administrative record. Second, the court found that the agency had arbitrarily concluded that um, the awardee and the next in line offerer were acceptable. So this is another case like uh, discussed by Craig, where there's an awardee, there's a next in line offeror, and then there is the protester. And so the protester has to challenge both of the um, offerors that are above it within the evaluation. And the, the court found that um, both of those offerors had been found acceptable when there was evidence in the record uh, to the contrary. With regard to the awardee, the argument was that the awardee had failed to include a, a teaming agreement that was required by the terms of the solicitation uh, in its proposal, and the court found that to be material and prejudicial. With regard to the next in line offeror, um, the court found that the agency had failed to reasonably evaluate the financial responsibility of that next in line offeror. And that's this is an important um, issue in the case because with, again, without challenging successfully the awardee and um, the next in line offerer, um, the protester would have had trouble, would probably not have established um, that it was an interested party. The court also found um, that the agency should have conducted discussions under DFARS 215.306. And as you may know, that DFARS provision provides that for acquisitions that are have an estimated value over $100 million, contracting officers should conduct discussions. 
And so there's a very detailed explanation by the court, uh, by Judge Solemson of how he understands uh, that term. And uh, I commend that to you if you have a, a, dis a decision uh, regarding discussions and over a hundred million dollars, very um, thorough discussion of that issue. And the judge concludes that in this case, the agency should have conducted discussions. And if the agency had conducted such discussions, all offerers would have had an opportunity to correct um, their proposals. And the protester in particular would have had an opportunity to correct the unacceptability of its technical proposal. So and again, a key finding uh, in the development of the case. And then last, the fourth issue the court found was that the agency had failed to sufficiently investigate allegations of a procurement official's improper conduct. Now, the protester raised both procurement integrity and organizational conflict of interest arguments. The court found that, um, that this set of facts did not fit within those specific um, elements for a pro, uh, procurement integrity and, a, and an OCI violation. However, it found that um, the protester had also raised the unfairness of a procurement official apparently attempting to steer the award to one of its competitors. A very serious allegation, obviously. And um, the court was greatly troubled by the agency's circumscribed investigation, and even more so by the facts that came to light during the protest at the court. And that's what I want to focus on now, those what came to light, what are the documents that were included and that came to light in the record that ultimately um, turned this protest. Regarding the, the violation of the court's rules um, on filing an administrative record, the court said, or the court noted that there were multiple filings after the initial administrative record was filed by the government, there were multiple additional filings to complete the record. And that's because documents that were referenced somewhere in the record that had been produced, um, certain documents had not been included. And so the court and the protester had to pursue the production of those additional documents to complete the administrative record before the court. And the court ultimately found that on two central issues in the case, the government had omitted critical documents that, quote, were directly and unequivocally that, I'm sorry, the documents directly and unequivocally undermine the government's position. So the court was very concerned. The first issue on which a document was omitted was whether the SSEB chair had improperly uh, steered or attempted to steer the awardee, uh, the contract to the awardee. And on this issue, the government initially failed to produce an internal army letter that terminated the SSEB chair from his role in the procurement. So protester has alleged that the SSEB chair has acted improperly and has attempted to steer the procurement to um, the awardee and the agency did not include in the record this termination letter. And the letter revealed that the termination was based on quote, repeated inconsistencies in the evaluation of proposals, including the omission of significant consensus findings. And so the letter said, the fact that these areas seem to persist with every new version of the proposal evaluation report has led to the conclusion that appointment of a new SSEB chairperson is necessary. The court found that that was directly relevant to the allegations of improper activity by that procurement official and attempting to steer the procurement and was deeply troubled by the, the government's failure to produce that document. The other document that was focused on in the court's decision was, went to the issue of whether the next in line offeror was eligible for award. Recall that in order to have standing and be an interested party, the protester was required to demonstrate that um, the next in line offeror was not eligible. And on this issue, the Army initially, again, failed to produce a DCMA um, report, 
which found that the next in line offer was, quote, not financially capable, end quote, of performing the contract. So again, a finding that DCMA made in the conduct, in the context of the procurement, of an important document that was not produced on the issue of the next in line offer of standing. Um, as I said, the court was deeply troubled by the government's uh, failure to, to include these documents. It, these documents apparently were not produced at the GAO either. The government took the position that they weren't directly relevant, uh, didn't feel like they were directly relevant to the issues. The court dismissed that. Um, and at the end of its uh, decision, directed the government to show cause why it should not be sanctioned for its failures with regard to the administrative record. Next slide. So what I just described was the merits decision in Oak Grove. The court issues a second decision in November of 2021 on the sanctions issue. And the court concludes that the government should be, should be sanctioned in this case and orders the government to pay the legal costs and the expenses that the protester incurred in dealing with the administrative record issues and the, the failures uh, with regard to the record. So the court rejected the government's what it called cramped view of relevance in a court of federal claims protest. And it clarified its view of the government's obligation to provide a complete record. Recall we said at the beginning at the GAO, the, the standard is relevant documents must be produced in an agency report, a complete report. At the court, a whole record, um, the whole record must be, com or, uh, must be produced. And so Judge Solomson clarifies how he views those term, that whole record requirement at the court. And he says that agencies must include in the record all documents related to their ultimate procurement decision, um, including documents directly or indirectly considered by the agency. So the, again, I said, as I said, the agency had said, well, these, these documents were indirectly relevant. Judge Solms had rejected that and said these were directly relevant and they undermined the agency's position. They should have been produced. Um, he, the judge also makes clear that, um, that documents relevant to the process of making the decision should be produced. So we shouldn't have an artificial distinction between, well, these documents are relevant to the substance of the decision and therefore we'll produce them, but these other documents are relevant to the process and therefore they're not directly relevant to the protest proceedings. The judge, uh, judge says that documents relevant to the process as well as the substance should be produced. Um, he also finds that documents that were before were available to the decision maker, even if not specifically considered by the decision maker should be produced. So we may have a source selection authority that has never put his eyes on a particular document or her eyes on a particular document, that shouldn't preclude the, the necessarily the production of that document. If the document was available to the decision maker or was before the decision maker, um, that's enough to require its production at the Court of Federal Claims. The judge then goes on to address two other issues that I think are important, particularly for practitioners at the court. First, he says, uh, or he questions whether deliberative materials should be produced. It, this is in a bit, um, you, you might call it dicta uh, in the decision because it wasn't directly at issue. But deliberative materials are things like internal documents, internal comments, draft reports, emails, meeting notes, all of those internal documents regarding the deliberations of the agency. And Judge Solomson concludes that those may be privileged. There's a deliberative process privilege that the government may be able to justify in some cases. But he says that's not relevance. There's a difference between a privileged document and a relevant document. And so query um, 
in going forward whether the a judge Solomonson would require production of all of these deliberative materials and whether other judges the court would do the same based on this distinction between privilege and relevance and finally judge Solomonson says it's worth also noting that discovery may be appropriate at the court to determine what is in the record and what is not in the record so discovery is generally um, not favored at the court, but Judge Solomonson makes the point that it may be appropriate in some cases in order to determine whether the record is complete or not. So another important point for practitioners to consider in the future. Next slide. So the takeaways here um, from my perspective are that in a GAO protest, reasoned judgments about relevance are permitted by the GAO's, by the GAO's rules. Um, but those judgments are not going to be controlling in a subsequent GAO, uh, Court of Federal Claims protest. And additional documents or portions of documents may be required to complete the record at the Court of Federal Claims. So we can't simply assume that in a protest that first is at the GAO and then is at the court, that the same administrative record applies to both. I think in the instance of a court action, diligence is required by the government, by government counsel, by DOJ, to understand what was produced at the GAO and what was withheld on relevance grounds and what may need to be included in the, in the record at the court. Um, discovery might be appropriate at the court to determine what is in and what is not in the record, as Judge Solomonson noted. And then the, the basic takeaway between GAO protests and court protests is that a court record is more likely to include a complete set of relevant documents without curation by the agency. Uh, it's also more likely to include documents that support the existing um, protest grounds and that might reveal supplemental protest grounds. So last slide, there's some questions that are remaining here um, that we will all continue to deal with as we um, address protests going forward. But I think Oak Grove is a cautionary tale uh, for the government in terms of what it includes in the record, particularly in a protest at the Court of Federal Claims. And I think it reflects um, I think the, the courts and the GAO's treatment of the record, I think they're divergent to use Craig's term, but they have a basis in the statute. So I think it's up to practitioners to understand that difference and to make strong arguments about why documents at GAO are relevant to the key terms of its protest. So with that, I will turn it over to Sherry uh, for the next session. Thanks, Rich. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to kick off the PubK uh, year in review. Uh, 2021 also brought a number of interesting developments in the area of corrective action challenges. Um, and so as we prepare to dive in, I will um, just note that I've been a bit under the weather this week. So uh, please bear with me and I will cross my fingers that uh, my voice holds out um, to get us through this discussion. Um, so if we can move to the next slide. Um, so before we talk about the developments that occurred in 2021, I'll just set the stage a bit. Um, in the past, I think that most of us would agree that traditionally the Court of Federal Claims has been considered to be the forum that tends to be more receptive um, to corrective action challenges than GAO. Um, so in situations where there's a protest of an award and the agency decides to take corrective action, uh, protesters pretty rarely have success challenging that corrective action at GAO. Um, as GAO has stated, it's not necessary for an agency to conclude that a protest is certain to be sustained before it can take corrective action, uh, where the agency has a reasonable concern that there were errors in the procurement 
even if the protest could be denied, GAO views it as within the agency's discretion to take corrective action. So as a result, um, protests to GAO attempting to block or limit corrective action are often met with um, GAO's familiar refrain that contracting officers have broad discretion to take corrective action where the agency has determined that such corrective action is necessary to ensure a fair and impartial competition. And as a general matter, the details of corrective action are within the sound discretion of the contracting agency. In contrast, um, if we move to the next slide, the court has traditionally been a more receptive forum uh, for corrective action challenges. Um, one of the best examples of this, uh, and one of the most cited cases, I think, in corrective action challenges has been uh, the Court of Federal Claims decision in Dell Federal Systems, um, where the court concluded that uh, even where an agency has rationally identified defects in the procurement, its corrective action must narrowly target the defects it's intended, it's, it's intended to remedy. Um, so unlike GAO, um, which has generally left corrective action determinations to the discretion of the agency, the court had indicated that it would take a closer look at corrective action determinations to assess whether they were appropriate to address the problem they were designed to remedy. Um, so corrective action challenges have traditionally been one of those few areas where many practitioners may have advised their clients that they might wanna consider bypassing GAO and protesting directly to the court. But then um, that equation changed a bit in 2018 when the federal circuit reversed the Dell decision. Um, the federal circuit noted that it had never adopted a heightened narrowly targeted standard and emphasized that agency corrective actions must be reviewed under the APA's highly deferential rational basis standard. Um, so if we move to the next slide, um, with the Federal Circuit's Dell decision, protesters hoping to challenge corrective action uh, became less optimistic than previously. At the start of 2021, some may have wondered whether uh, they had any better chance at the court under a highly deferential APA standard than they did under GAO's highly deferential standard. And <clears throat> indeed, uh, 2021 may have started off with protesters wondering if perhaps GAO might actually offer some hope for corrective action challenges given that GAO had actually sustained corrective action challenges the year before. Um, although in that decision, um, which is referenced here on your slide, Paraton, um, GAO sustained a challenge to corrective action as being too narrow to resolve a procurement flaw, um, not overbroad, um, which is generally a different sort of consideration. So moving to the next slide. So um, what happened with corrective action in 2021? Well, um, at GAO, there was not a lot of movement. Um, GAO indicated that it views the Federal Circuit's decision in Dell to align with GAO's position that agencies should be given broad discretion in their corrective action. Um, as a result, I think we can expect GAO to continue to take a position um, that it's very deferential to agencies um, in corrective action challenges. But at the court, there were some significant developments. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so one major development in this area was um, the court's decision in Superior Optical. Um, that was uh, Senior Judge Brugink's decision. And it began as most corrective action protests do as a protest of an award at GAO. Um, the procurement was a lowest priced, technically acceptable procurement. Um, PBS consultants submitted a low priced proposal, but it was eliminated because it was found to be unacceptable. Uh, the VA then awarded a contract to Superior Optical, and PDS protested the award to GAO. Uh, in response to the protests, 
the agency announced that it was going to take voluntary corrective action by canceling the award to Superior Optical, allowing proposal revisions and making a new award decision. Uh, Superior objected to the agency's proposed corrective action um, in response to the corrective action during uh, PDS's protest. But GAO concluded that the corrective action rendered the protest academic and dismissed PDS's protest. Superior then filed a corrective action protest at the Court of Federal Claims, arguing that the agency's decision to take corrective action was not rational. Uh, specifically, Superior argued that the underlying award decision and the agency's original determination that PDS's proposal was technically unacceptable were not flawed. And therefore it was irrational for the agency to cancel the award and allow for proposal revisions. Uh, Judge Brueging agreed and held that the agency had no justification for its decision to take corrective action. Um, to very poorly paraphrase Judge Brueging, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, significantly, the Federal Circuit affirmed this decision confirming that corrective action challenges remain a viable possibility at the court. <clears throat> Moving on to the next slide. Um, the court's decision in Sagam Securite Senegal provided further indication that the court remains willing to consider corrective action challenges. Um, this case began with the Department of State making an award to Torres. Um, Sagam protested the award at GAO, and the agency agreed to take corrective action by reevaluating proposals and making a new award decision. However, during the initial corrective action, the agency discovered a Procurement Integrity Act violation in which the agency had disclosed Sagam's pricing information to Torres. In response to the Pro Procurement Integrity Act violation, the agency announced that it was planning to cancel the solicitation and would issue a new solicitation in the future. Sagam protested the cancellation to the court, arguing that the agency's corrective action was irrational. The court agreed, concluding that cancellation of the solicitation would do nothing to remedy the improper disclosure to Torres because Torres would simply be able to, comp to compete on the reissued solicitation. In Sagam, the court specifically addressed the Federal Circuit's Dell decision, noting that the standard is very deferential um, to agencies, but it's not a carte blanche for the agency to decide what sort of correct corrective action it'll take. In the end, uh, the court concluded that the, the De Department of State's corrective action lacked a rational basis. Um, interestingly, this case was another case similar to the Oak Grove case that Rich mentioned, in which the court appeared to be deeply troubled by the agency's conduct. Um, and I'll quote from a portion of the court's decision. Um, it's important to note, the court said, that the facts here are unusual. The CO and the state acknowledged that a PIA, Procurement Integrity Act, violation occurred but failed to take steps which would restore fairness to this procurement. The court understands that most contracting officers safeguard the proposal information sent to them by offerors and work diligently to prevent rather than initiate improper disclosures of this information. In addition, the court recognizes that most procuring agencies take steps to remedy a PIA violation once the facts of the violation come to light instead of ignoring the harm the PIA violation caused. Given that the agency in this procurement is so out of step with the norm, analogous bid protests are few. So in the realm of corrective action protests, 2021 was an exciting year um, because it appeared that the court seemed to breathe a little bit of life into the potential uh, to challenge corrective actions in the court. Um, but it also appeared that 2021 may have brought an unfortunate wealth of improper agency action um, between Oak Grove and the Sagam um, decision. So with that, I will turn it over to Kevin. Thank you, Sherry. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm happy to be kicking off the last of our topics. 
with a bid protest panel. And with that, we'll start with our first slide. What I'm gonna to talk to you today about is other transaction authority protests and the question of where does jurisdiction reside for the bid protester? Now we know over the last 10 years or so, there's been a real acceleration by agencies and their use of OTAs. And with that, the question of where a bid protester has jurisdiction has become more acute. So that's why we're talking about that today. We have one new development in the case law in 2021, which will be the punchline to this discussion. Let's start by setting the table. The nature of OTAs and the statutory jurisdiction charter for each of the fora that you might choose uh, if confronted with an OTA award that you as an offeror are disappointed in. So first of all, what are OTAs? OTAs are transactions other than contracts, grants, or cooperative agreements. Now you'll see there I've emphasized the language other than contracts. I'm foreshadowing for you what some of the controversy is going to be under the case law. What does it mean other than contracts? Well, most government contract practitioners and uh, the Government Accountability Office attorneys and the Court of Federal Claims in grappling with that kind of, of specific government contracts legalese would imply the word procurement before the word contracts in that description of OTAs. But would district courts? Not necessarily. So there I'm foreshadowing some tension between the case law of those two fora. All right, so your possibilities as a bid protester would be to go to the Government Accountability Office, the Court of Federal Claims, or the Federal District Court if you're challenging an OTA award. We'll put aside for now, well, forever, as far as this topic is concerned today, the question of an agency level protest. Those tend to be specific for the solicitation involved uh, where you'll see instructions affirmatively to the contractors who want to pursue an agency level protest. We'll put that aside. At GAO, their jurisdiction covers objections to a solicitation for or the award of a contract for the procurement of property or services. And there the emphasis again, contract for the procurement of property or services. So it's clear at GAO, we're talking about jurisdiction over the award of procurement contracts. Next, the US Court of Federal Claims. The court has exclusive jurisdiction over protests of, quote, any alleged violation of statute or regulation in connection with the procurement. So at the court, the emphasis is on the language in connection with a procurement. Smacks of the term procurement contract perhaps, and, and uh, perhaps something more, which we'll talk about in a minute. Finally, at the federal district courts, they generally have, they have general APA jurisdiction. So Administrative Procedures Act jurisdiction, Greg mentioned it earlier. However, there's a carve out in that jurisdiction except where the Court of Federal Claims has exclusive jurisdiction. So the federal district courts are gonna be very mindful that their general APA jurisdiction does not extend into the exclusive jurisdiction of the Court of Federal Claims. And that exclusive jurisdiction is protests involving alleged violation of statute or regulation in connection with a procurement. So that sets the table. Let's talk more about uh, the controversies that have developed for OTA jurisdiction on the next slide. So uh, as we consider the most recent case law that sets the stage for this year's additional case at the Court of Federal Claims, there's really three data points we have. First of all, the GAO will not consider protests of OTA awards, but let's be more precise. It's well established at GAO that a bid protest will not be entertained 
that attacks the source selection decision for an OC OTA award. So think in terms of challenging the evaluation and the ultimate award decision. Kind of your traditional bid protest grounds. Those are not gonna lodge at GAO. You will be dismissed. But what remains is GAO will entertain a bid protest that involves a question of whether the agency has sufficient authority to use an OTA for that award and whether the OTA is the appropriate vehicle for that, for that solicitation and that acquisition. Different kind of bid protest. Uh, and, and so the general statement that OTA awards will not be entertained at GAO is, is generally correct. So what about at the Court of Federal Claims? The seminal case there is the SpaceX case. Uh, and uh, that case was a couple of years ago where Judge Grigsby dismissed an OTA protest for lack of jurisdiction and transferred that case to federal district court at the plaintiff's request. The case ended up in uh, district court in California where it received a merits decision. SpaceX was not successful, but the key issue is that Judge Grigsby examined whether the OTA jurisdiction was well-founded and found that it was not, that there was not sufficient connection to a procurement as its statutory authority for jurisdiction would require. Let's talk a little bit about that case's facts before we get to the federal district court's data point for jurisdiction over OTA protests. So in SpaceX, it involved an Air Force procurement uh, for the development of prot prototype rockets for sending uh, national security payloads, satellites, sensitive satellites in, into space. The OTA at issue was that prototype award and the Air Force made three awards. Uh, one to uh, UL, uh, United Launch Alliance, ULA, which is a joint venture between Lockheed Martin and Boeing. So ULA got one. Blue Origin uh, also received a, um, an agreement for that prototype development. And the third was um, ATK, uh, Orbital ATK, which is now a part of uh, Northrop Grumman. SpaceX was left out of the mix. And so they filed their protest. Now, there was general agreement at the court among the parties that the OTA itself, the prototype OTA itself, was not a procurement contract and standing alone was not in connection with the procurement as the court's jurisdiction would require. Where the controversy came in was uh, when SpaceX argued, well, wait a minute, we think there is a connection to a procurement because a subsequent phase of this program that the Air Force is running will result in a procurement contract for the launch services themselves. All right, so the OTA is for the prototype development, but down the road, argued SpaceX, there will be a procurement contract for the launch services themselves. And so this OTA is in fact in connection with a procurement. So that's what Judge, Judge Rigsby looked at very carefully and ultimately came to the distinction that, to the, to the conclusion that the OTA award on one hand, and the procurement contract down the road were separate and distinct. There wasn't a sufficient connection to a procurement. That is the uh, procurement contract ultimately that would be awarded down the road for the launches themselves. And she came to that conclusion because most importantly, the production contract as it was called down the road for the launch services would not be limited to the awardees for the OTA. So SpaceX could still compete for the launch services production contract down the road, even though it hadn't received an OTA like the other three. That was most important to Judge uh, Rigsby. There were other, Rigsby, there were other uh, facts that supported that conclusion of separateness as well. There were two different acquisition strategies. Um, there were, um, uh, there was a separation in time. There was other things that, that uh, Judge Grigsby concluded, the separate and distinct nature of those two phases uh, created a separation that meant that connection to a procurement 
did not exist. And so the, the, uh, the court's jurisdiction did not extend to that OTA award. All right. That's, that's a good and probably our most important and most clear data point for this jurisdictional uh, discussion. Let's go to the district court. Our best data point there is MD helicopters versus the United States. That was in uh, Arizona, so Ninth Circuit. There, MD Helicopters files a protest uh, having to do with an OTA award, and ultimately it's dismissed with the district court finding they didn't have sufficient jurisdiction, that there was a connection to a procurement, which meant that the Court of Federal Claims exclusive jurisdiction held sway. Here's what happened in MD Helicopters. The Army held a uh, solicitation for the uh, design, development, and ultimately the production of new generation reconnaissance helicopters. The OTA at issue before the district court was for the preliminary design of the new helicopter. And then the way that the acquisition would work was through a series of down selects. The Army would continue to winnow down the field of competition until ultimately there'd be a single award to the uh, production contractor I'll, down the road again, uh, down the road from the initial OTA award. Now, the empty helicopters decision when read closely raises some uh, issues of uncertainty in terms of prognosticating about what a decision uh, in any particular case in the future in the various district courts might be. And the reason for that is at the U.S. Court of Federal Claims with its long history and experience in these kinds of matters um, addresses its own jurisdiction under the Tucker Act when confronted with an OTA uh, protest in determining whether there's sufficient connection uh, to a procurement. On the other hand, at the district courts who lack that experience, and that uh, legacy institutional knowledge. They rarely get bid protests. Forget about OTA protests in any particular district court. That court under those circumstances is looking at its own jurisdiction and asking whether the exclusive jurisdiction of the Court of Federal Claims carving out and away from the district courts their jurisdiction uh, leaves the district court with jurisdiction over the OTA protest or not. And it's in that set of circumstances where we see the analysis in MD helicopters take a different form than you might predict uh, if a court of federal claims judge were looking at the same issue. So for example, uh, MD helicopters, the judge conf uh, confronted this issue really from two perspectives. First of all, under the district courts, uh, APA uh, jurisdiction. The judge asked the question, is the waiver of sovereign immunity under the APA that provides jurisdiction for the court, um, does it include this kind of dispute? The court came to the conclusion that no, it didn't, because in looking at the Ninth Circuit case law, it saw that the carve out uh, of its jurisdiction included disputes involving government contracts and relief involving the award of a government contract. Missing from that discussion was the loaded terminology procurement contract. The Ninth Circuit used the, the terminology government contract or contract. So the district court judge looked at that and said, notwithstanding. Uh, the arguments that uh, an OTA is not a contract. It is a contract. It is agreement between the two parties. Its terms make clear it's a contract. So without delving into the niceties of procurement contract, the court came to the conclusion that its jurisdiction did not cover a protest involving a government contract and the OTA was one. All right, we know that the Court of Federal Claims would, would come at that from a different direction. Secondly, the district court asked itself, did uh, the 
sunset provision of the Administrative Disputes Resolution Act, the sunset provision that went into effect January 1 of 2001, doing away with what we called scan wheel jurisdiction over bid protests at the district court. Uh, did that do away with the jurisdiction that might otherwise apply here? And in looking at this, the district court came to the conclusion, yes, the sunset took away the district court's opportunity for jurisdiction over uh, matters uh, in connection with the procurement, echoing the Tucker Act jurisdiction, in connection with the procurement. Uh, in that case, the, the, in that analysis, the court came to the conclusion that uh, because the helicopters solicitation continued to winnow down to ultimately the acquisition of helicopters, then this was in connection with the procurement. The district court did not have jurisdiction because the Court of Federal Claims under the Tucker Act has exclusive jurisdiction over such matters. I think they got that right. Um, and ultimately, they got the, the disposition of the case correct. The problem is two, two things. Uh, number one, as I said before, the, the failure to deal with the niceties of procurement contract versus contract, which basically folds an OTA as a contract uh, in with other kinds of traditional procurement contracts and, and does away with district court jurisdiction over that. We already know that standing alone an OTA without a connection to a procurement uh, is not going to have jurisdiction at the Court of Federal Claims. The second problem I see in MD helicopters was in coming to the conclusion that the address sunsetting of Scanwell jurisdiction did away with the district court's jurisdiction and left it exclusively at the Court of Federal Claims is the fact that in connection with the procurement, in this case, the ultimate procurement that the court looked to was the possibility at the end of the road, after winnowing down completely, there'd be one helicopter contractor that would receive an OTA with a production uh, possibility, a production option perhaps. But the fact that at the end of the road, it was an OTA and not a procurement contract. Remember SpaceX at the end of the road was a procurement contract. Empty helicopters, the end of the road, another OTA. That's never even considered by the uh, district court. And maybe it doesn't make any difference. Uh, it didn't make any difference to the district court because they said, look, at the end of the day, there's an acquisition. There's, the government is going to be buying these helicopters. That's in connection with a procurement. And, and no fussing around by the district court in that case with uh, whether an OTA is a procurement contract, a procurement, or any or something different. So uh, as you as you look at the district court case, I worry about um, a disconnect between how the Court of Federal Claims analyzes these issues and how a district court might analyze them, and I worry about uh, the the lack of certainty that comes out of that divergence. Uh, let's go on to the next slide, please. All right, that brings us to the punchline. What's new this year? So what's new this year is the kinemetrics case at the US Court of Federal Claims. Uh, and I think uh, coming on the heels of the MD helicopters case, which you can now tell I feel um, brings in some uncertainty in terms of how district courts might handle these issues. The kinemetrics case is, is straightforward and uh, provides at least an additional data point of some certainty at the court. That case uh, decided by senior judge Letow um, involved a kind of novel solicitation. It's called a commercial solutions opening. And that solicitation is a method by which DOD acquires innovative commercial items and a new technology. So an effort by DOD to uh, many times uh, hand in glove with a, an OTA award ultimately to invite uh, commercial companies with the best innovative technology into uh, providing solutions for difficult problems. And in this case, it was under uh, DOD's prototype projects OTA authority where they were acquiring 
uh, seismic equipment for monitoring nuclear treaty compliance. Here's what it looked like. This CSO was basically nine little mini solicitations, one for each of nine topics. And in each instance, uh, the offerors were invited to submit white papers. And if the white papers were good, they would be asked to submit a technical and cost proposal. Now, topic number nine was the one at issue in this case for the seismic uh, equipment. And topic nine did away with the white papers, just went straight to proposals. And importantly, what the solicitation said was the award uh, for each of these topics, including topic nine, would be for a contract or another transaction, okay? So we know when they're talking about contracts, they're talking about procurement contracts. So it's going to be one or the other, but it didn't say which. And that's not that unusual with solicitations nowadays. You, you often see uh, the use of that or contracts or other transactions. But that becomes important to Judge Leto uh, as he considers the jurisdictional question. Let's see how. Let's go to the next slide. So the Air Force awards the seismic equipment uh, award under topic nine and uh, Kinemetrics doesn't get the award, goes to the Court of Federal Claims challenging the award decision. And um, first, at first, uh, DOJ's reaction was to challenge the jurisdiction. I think they were, uh, they at DOJ were uh, focused on the possibility of an OTA. That knee-jerk reaction was then overcome by some, some um, more in-depth consideration of what uh, the solicitation provided and perhaps ultimately what the award would look like. And they acquiesced to the jurisdiction of the court. Judge Letow uh, addressed jurisdiction uh, in any event, however. And the key for the judge is that the ultimate award was not an OTA. The ultimate award was a straight ahead IDIQ contract. No question the court has jurisdiction over that. And so he, he pushed aside the jurisdictional question very bluntly. We have, a, these are my words, we have a procurement contract. This is in connection with the procurement. We have jurisdiction under the Tucker Act. This isn't that difficult. Don't worry about the fact that you have a non-traditional solicitation that might provide for an OTA. And the, the judge made very clear the distinction with SpaceX. In SpaceX, there was no procurement contract sufficiently connected to the OTA award. Remember, that procurement contract was down the road and was separate and distinct in uh, Judge Grigsby's view from the OTA and SpaceX. So, so two very different uh, cases there. And they drew the, the right kinds of different uh, decisions as a result. So what are we going to say in the end? We know under kinemetrics and the other cases, the key is a direct line from the OTA to a procurement contract. Or perhaps if you keep empty helicopters in mind, a direct line from uh, an OTA to a procurement. In that case, the district court seemed to see things a little broader. Then, however, to, th to throw some uncertainty into the mix, if you, if you end up at a district court, you have to be ready that the district court is not addressing these issues with the same legacy information and experience. So uh, th they may grapple with this distinction between uh, procurement contracts and regular contracts. Um, so. Uh, I think in the end, what we have to look forward to is for practitioners, what do you do? You, you're, you represent a company, disappointed offer or OTA award, whatever the facts are considering, whether there's some argument for connection to a procurement, what is your uh, procedural strategy? Where do you go? Well, I, I think that uh, if you do feel you have a strong argument that there is a connection to a subsequent procurement contract, um, then uh, you'd be going to the Court of Federal Claims and hoping to convince them 
uh, along the lines of kinemetrics and SpaceX. However, if that argument is tenuous, if that argument uh, suffers from a disconnect, uh, like in MD helicopters, between the OTA award that's at issue and a subsequent procurement or acquisition, then you've got a harder decision to make. So what do you do? Well, one thing to think about is if you go to the Court of Federal Claims and you can't establish that connection to a procurement and you do like SpaceX and you say, court, if you don't have jurisdiction, please transfer this to a federal district court and you, you identify the venue that you would like transfer uh, to go to, uh, then you hedge your bets and you end up at the federal district court and you make your arguments. Well, why go to the Court of Federal Claims first and not the district court first, you might ask, uh, if, if the connection to a procurement is tenuous. I think that the order of which court you go to first is very important. And I wonder to myself whether uh, it, it would be best to go to the Court of Federal Claims, hope you can establish the connection. If you cannot, go to, you'll end up at the district court with a transfer. And th in that case, unlike MD Helicopters, where MD Helicopters came to the district court straight away, if you go after you've been denied jurisdiction at the Court of Federal Claims, I think you might have a better argument uh, or at least have a psychological advantage that you wouldn't otherwise have where the court would not want to bribe you completely of any review. Uh, and it would also have uh, the, the decision of the Court of Federal Claims discussing the jurisdictional issue. I think that would be helpful. So that's the latest on OTA jurisdiction. I'm going to hand it back to Alan uh, to close us out on this great panel. Uh, Kevin, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all of our panel members for an outstanding presentation. Uh, lots of material, lots of great topics to come in. I remind folks that we've got a chat box open and you can send your comments to admin at pubkgroup.com. We'll collect those even if they come in after this program session ends. A uh, couple of questions did come in, uh, administrative questions. Will the slides be available? Yes. Uh, we'll make all of these slides available to you at the end of the entire uh, PubK program. Uh, we'll make sure we've got them uh, all in the right format and uh, double checking all the citations. We'll let you know when all the slides and the audio recording is available. I've also had a couple of questions about the CLE. You may have seen the poll questions pop up during the course of the presentation. Uh, many of you answered them, uh, some of you answered even if you weren't interested in CLE, and we appreciate knowing that you're paying attention. Uh, here again, uh, that's really for our administrative uh, responsibilities as the uh, submitter to the various state boards to make sure we get the questions, the, the confirmation of attendees, and we'll notify you, uh, we'll notify all registrants after the program is over and when we receive the approval from the various state boards as they come in. Uh, we'll be submitting all of the information uh, shortly after the program ends. It'll take a few weeks of my guests to get uh, the state approvals. Uh, we've submitted in seven jurisdictions. We plan to submit in seven jurisdictions. If you've got a question about it, you can uh, send it to admin at PubK Group, and uh, we'll try to get you uh, get information. Uh, so let me again, uh, there's one question that did come in and I think the sort of provocative, I'll open it up to the panel in a couple of minutes still remaining. Uh, if you want to look ahead to uh, 2022, a preview of what you're going to say next year at this panel, uh, what do you think the hot uh, protest topics are likely to be? Knowing where we're seeing uh, increased spending, particularly on infrastructure, will we see uh, GAO and the Court of Federal Claims uh, dabbling in some of those infrastructure contracts next year. Uh, Jay, can I uh, start with you? What, uh, what's your best guess as to where the pr protests are going to be coming from? Uh, that's a great question, Alan. Uh, I, you know, I, su I suppose that could certainly be one, uh, one source of protest. Uh, you know, I think the great thing about this panel is, you know, every year we have new stuff to talk about and it's really hard to predict where things are going. I will say, you know, I do think that um, 
you know, with respect to Rich's presentation, that record issues at both GAO and the court are going to continue to be uh, a hot issue. So, so that's that's certainly worth watching. Right. Sheree, what uh, what's your view? And you're on mute. There you go. I'm really interested to see how um, vaccination um, affects key personnel issues, um, regardless of whether the president's vaccine mandate is upheld or not. Um, you know, company vaccine policies um, and whether those are having a, a great impact on an, a company's ability to continue to offer their key personnel, uh, given the very um, some would say draconian um rules about key personnel availability um particularly at gao i think that's something we might see in some of the bid protest decisions coming out this year and we're going to touch more on the, the vaccinations both in our uh, labor and employment panel and our uh, statute of regs panel so if you're particularly interested in that area i hope uh, you're not already registered you still have time to register for those panels as well uh rich uh your view of uh, coming attractions? Yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, I think as Jay mentioned, there'll be some more attention in the coming year on, on the record. Um, Judge Solomson's decision is, um, is noteworthy, not just because he sanctioned the government in that case. Uh, you could say that that was a, um, an unusual set of facts, but because he raises issues that I think are really important about um, what is the right record, both at the GAO and at the court? And I think um, those are questions that practitioners and government agencies alike will have to deal with in the coming year. Uh, I don't want you to last to uh, Kevin and Craig. I want to give you a different question. I'm interested in your opinion on it. For the last couple of years, <clears throat> the Justice Department has suggested doing away with the so-called second bite at the apple. Uh, the opportunity to go first to GAO and then to the Court of Federal Claims. Many of the conversations today address that. We haven't seen that proposal from the Biden administration's Justice Department, but it may just be a, a period of time. Uh, your view on the uh, likelihood of, of seeing that and the importance of addressing that issue, either on a standalone or my view, a more comprehensive review of all of the differences and similarities and differences between the various forums. I'm glad to take a, a first crack at that, Alan. I, you know, we see that we see that a lot. And at least from my perspective, having uh, now spent uh, three decades in the in the area, including having witnessed it uh, prior to the ADRA and the Scanwell jurisdiction Kevin was talking about, I really uh, when I hear those topics come up and when I hear people pushing, it's usually somebody who are uh, disgruntled by something that's happened in a large procurement. It tends to, it tends to bother me because, you know, one of the things, if you look at the world stage of procurement that the United States has looked to as a leader for is on competition law. And one of the critical things that's important and separates the United States procurement system from, from other procurement systems is the ability and Congress's design really to leverage disappointed offers, uh, economic interests to bring matters into fora and make sure our procurement runs properly. And quite frankly, I think it runs great right now. I really, uh, I think it's important. If any, if anything, you know, I think that sometimes with the increased uh, prevalence of task orders uh, and IDIQ contracts and task orders that not having a second level of review on some of these larger task order contracts is a problem. So from my perspective, I really hope that, uh, that Congress, uh, to the extent people push it to do so, does not ratchet back on having uh, GAO's ability, GAO's critical to the process or the court's ability. They serve really complementary roles in this process and taking them away is not helpful to the procurement system from my perspective. Last word. I'll pile on there. I, I have the same view and I would I would cite to the fact that uh, the studies that have looked at 
uh, the second bite issue and the issue of delay and uh, important procurements and the like show that these are, uh, this is not a problem. This is uh, uh, a very small, infinitesimal percentage of uh, contracts and protests that result in uh, major delays and in second bites uh, compared to the total number of protests that are handled. So uh, I would point that out, first of all. Second of all, I would say, if there's any kind of protest reform, quote unquote, that would take hold, it's probably in the second bite area because that's what people focus on and that's what they read about in the Washington Post. I'll wrap up by saying, in terms of uh, what to watch out for in the coming year, I think that the continued use of OTAs, especially for space acquisitions, is gonna continue. And, and I think it's gonna breed protests. And the other area, is um, following up on what Sherry said. I think there's going to be OTAs used for vaccine development and more generally uh, a, a number of vaccine development programs for the next decade as we confront this COVID problem uh, that are going to take on some creative approaches to share the investment with the contractor and the government that are going to breed interesting solicitations interesting jurisdictional questions and interesting uh, issues concerning the evaluation of proposals. You've, uh, you've not only given us a lot of information about where we are, but a little bit of insight into where we're going, and I appreciate that. A big thanks to our panel for their outstanding presentation. And let me again thank all of our event sponsors for their participation and support. Thanks and look forward to seeing you at future PubK annual review programs.